Section 22 of Diaries Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. It was Easter Monday that I was invited to breakfast at the Earl of Arundel's. I took my leave of him in his bed, where I left that great and excellent man in tears on some private discourse of crosses that had befallen his illustrious family, particularly the undutifulness of his grandson Philip, turning Dominican friar, since Cardinal of Norfolk, and the misery of his country now embroiled in civil war. He caused his gentlemen to give me directions, all written with his own hand, what curiosities I should inquire after in my journey, and so in joining me to write sometimes to him, I departed. There stayed for me below Mr. Henry Howard, afterward Duke of Norfolk, Mr. J. Digby, son of Sir Kenelm Digby, and other gentlemen who conducted me to the coach. The famous lapidaries of Venice for false stones and pastes, so as to emulate the best diamonds, rubies, etc., were Marco Torasso and Gilbert. In company then with Mr. Waller, one Captain Ray, son of Sir Christopher, whose father had been in arms against his majesty, and therefore by no means welcome to us, with Mr. Abdi, a modest and learned man, we got that night to Vicenza, passing by the Jujanian hills, celebrated for the prospects and furniture of rare simples, which we found growing about them. The ways were something deep, the whole country flat and even as a bowling green. The common fields lie square and are orderly planted with fruit trees, which the vines run and embrace for many miles, with delicious streams creeping along the ranges. Vicenza is a city in the Marquisate of Treviso, yet appertaining to the Venetians, full of gentlemen and splendid palaces, to which the famous Palladio, born here, has exceedingly contributed, having been the architect. Most conspicuous is the Hall of Justice. It has a tower of excellent work. The lower pillars are of the first order. Those in the three upper corridors are Doric, under them are shops in a spacious piazza. The hall was built in imitation of that at Padua, but of a nobler design, a la Mordaine. The next morning we visited the theatre, as being of that kind the most perfect now standing, and built by Palladio, in exact imitation of the ancient Romans, and capable of containing five thousand spectators. The scene, which is all of stone, represents an imperial city, the order Corinthian decorated with statues. Over the scenario is inscribed Virtuti ac genio Olympior, Academia Theatrum Hoca Fundamentis Erexit Palladio Architect, 1584. The scene declines eleven feet, the soffito painted with clouds. To this there joins a spacious hall for solemn days to ballot in, and a second for the academics. In the piazza is also the podesta, or governor's house, the facciata being of the Corinthian order, very noble. The piazza itself is so large as to be capable of jousts and tournaments, the nobility of this city being exceedingly addicted to this knight errantry and other martial diversions. In this place are two pillars in imitation of those at St Mark's at Venice, bearing one of them a winged lion, the other the statue of St John the Baptist. In a word, this sweet town has more well-built palaces than any of its dimensions in all Italy, besides a number begun and not yet finished, but of stately design, by reason of the domestic dissensions between them and those of Brescia, fermented by the sage Venetians, lest by combining they might think of recovering their ancient liberty. For this reason also are permitted those disorders and insolence committed at Padua among the youth of these two territories. It is no dishonour in this country to be some generations in finishing their palaces, that without exhausting themselves by a vast expense at once, they may at last erect a sumptuous pile. Count Olen's palace is near perfected in this manner. Count Olmarini is more famous for his garden 
Romans, being without the walls, especially his Cedradrio, or conserve of oranges, eleven score of my paces long, set in order and ranges, making a canopy all the way by their intermixing branches for more than two hundred of my single paces, and which, being full of fruit and blossoms, was a most delicious sight. In the middle of this garden was a cupola made of wire, supported by slender pillars of brick, so closely covered with ivy, both without and within, that nothing was to be perceived but green. Between the arches there dangled festoons of the same. Here is likewise a most inextricable labyrinth. I had in this town recommendation to a very civil and ingenious apothecary called Angelico, who had a pretty collection of paintings. I would fain have visited a palace called the Rotunda, which was a mile out of town, belonging to Count Marthio Capra, but one of our companions hastening to be gone, and little minding anything save drinking and folly, caused us to take coach sooner than we should have done. A little from the town we passed the Campo Marzio, set out in imitation of ancient Rome, wherein the nobles exercised their horses, and the ladies made the corso. It is entered by a stately triumphal arch, the invention of Palladio. Verona Being now set out for Verona, about midday we dined at Ostaria Nova, and came late to our resting place, which was the Cavalletto, just over the monument of the Scaligeri, formerly princes of Verona, adorned with many devices in stone of ladders, alluding to the name. Early next morning we went about the city, which is built on the gentle declivity and bottom of a hill, environed in part with some considerable mountains and downs of fine grass, like some places in the south of England, and on the other side having the rich plain where Achaius Marius overthrew the Cimbrians. The city is divided in the midst by the river Adige, over which are diverse stately bridges, and on its banks are many goodly palaces, wherever one is well painted in caroscuro on the outside, as are diverse in this dry climate of Italy. The first thing that engaged our attention and wonder too was the amphitheatre, which is the most entire of ancient remains now extant. The inhabitants call it the arena. It has two porticos, one within the other, and is thirty-four rods long, twenty-two in breadth, with forty-two ranks of stone benches or seats, which reach to the top. The vastness of the marble stones is stupendous. L.V. Flaminius Consul Anno Orb Con Lee, this I esteem to be one of the noblest antiquities in Europe. It is so vast and entire, having escaped the ruins of so many other public buildings for above 1,400 years. There are other arches, as that of the Victory of Marius, temples, aqueducts, etc., showing still considerable remains in several places of the town, and how magnificent it has formerly been. It has three strong castles and a large and noble wall. Indeed, the whole city is bravely built, especially the Senate House, where we saw those celebrated statues of Cornelius Nepos, Aemilius Marcus, Plinius and Vitruvius, all having honoured Verona by their birth, and of later date, Julius Caesar Scaliger, that prodigy of learning. In the evening we saw the garden of Count Justus' villa, where a walk's cut out of the main rock, from whence we had a pleasant prospect of Mantua and Parma, though at a great distance. At the entrance of this garden grows the goodliest cypress I fancy in Europe, cut in a pyramid. It is a prodigious tree, both for breadth and height, entirely covered and thick to the base. Dr. Cortone, a civilian, showed us, among other rarities, a St. Dorothea of Raphael. We could not see the rare drawings, especially of Parmensis, belonging to Dr. Marcello, another advocate, on account of his absence. Verona deserved all those elegies Scaliger has honoured it with, for in my opinion the situation is the most delightful I ever saw. It is so sweetly mixed with rising ground and valleys, so elegantly planted with trees, on which Bacchus seems riding, as it were, in triumph every autumn, for the vines reach from tree to tree. 
Here of all places I have seen in Italy would I fix a residence. Well has that learned man given it the name of the very eye of the world. Escelimundi Cyrus Itali Coeli. Flos orbium, flos cornisquium, qui ammonium quot, quot sunt rutu quot furi verona. The next morning we travelled over the downs where Marius fought and fancied ourselves about Winchester and the country toward Dorsetshire. We dined at an inn called Cavalli Caschieri near Peschiera, a very strong fort of the Venetian Republic and near the Lago di Garda, which disembogues into that of Mantua, near forty miles in length, highly spoken of by my Lord Arundel to me as the most pleasant spot in Italy, for which reason I observed it with the more diligence, alighting out of the coach and going up to a grove of cypresses growing about a gentleman's country house, from whence indeed it presents a most surprising prospect. The hills and gentle risings about it produce oranges, citrons, olives, figs, and other tempting fruits, and the waters abound in excellent fish, especially trouts. In the middle of this lake stands Semonia on an island. Here Captain Ray bought a pretty nag of the master of our inn, where we dined, for eight pistols, which his wife, our hostess, was so unwilling to part with that she did nothing but kiss and weep and hang about the horse's neck till the captain rode away. Brescia We came this evening to Brescia, which next morning we traversed, according to our custom, in search of antiquities and new sites. Here I purchased of old Lazzarino Cominazzo my fine carbine, which cost me nine pistols, this city being famous for these firearms, and that workman Johannes Baptisto Franco, the best esteemed. The city consists most in artists, every shop abounding in guns, swords, armourers, etc. Most of the workmen come out of Germany. It stands in a fertile plain, yet the castle is built on a hill. The streets abound in fair fountains. The Torre della Palada is of a noble Tuscan order, and the Senate House is inferior to few. The piazza is but indifferent, some of the houses arched as at Padua. The cathedral was under repair. We would from hence have visited Parma, Piacenza, Mantua, etc., but the banditti and other dangerous parties being abroad, committing many enormities, we were contented with the Pisgah sight of them. We dined next day at Orsa Vecchia, and after dinner passed by an exceeding strong fort of the Venetians called Orsa Nova on their frontier, then by the river Rollio, and so by San Anno, where we enter the Spanish dominions, and that night arrived at Crema, which belongs to Venice and is well defended. The Podesta's palace is finely built, and so is the Duomo, or cathedral, and the tower to it, with an ample piazza. Milan Early next day, after four miles riding, we entered into the state of Milan and passed by Lodi, a great city famous for cheese, little short of the best parmigiano. We dined at Marignano, ten miles before coming to Milan, where we met half a dozen suspicious cavaliers, who yet did us no harm. Then passing us through a continual garden, we went on with exceeding pleasure, for it is the paradise of Lombardy, the highways as even and straight as a line, the fields to a vast extent planted with fruit about the enclosures, vines to every tree at equal distances, and watered with frequent streams. There was likewise much corn and olives in abundance. At approach of the city, some of our company, in dread of the Inquisition, severer here than in all Spain, thought of throwing away some Protestant books and papers. We arrived about three in the afternoon, when the officers searched us thoroughly for prohibited goods, but finding we were only gentlemen travellers, dismissed us for a small reward, and we went quietly to our inn, the Three Kings, where for that day we refreshed ourselves as we had need. The next morning we delivered our letters of recommendation to the learned and courteous Ferrarius, a doctor of the Ambrosian College, 
who conducted us to all the remarkable places of the town, the first of which was the famous cathedral. We entered by a portico, so little inferior to that of Rome, that when it is finished, it will be hard to say which is the fairest. The materials are all of white and black marble, with columns of great height, of Egyptian granite. The outside of the church is so full of sculpture that you may number four thousand statues, all of white marble, among which that of St. Bartholomew is esteemed a masterpiece. The church is very spacious, almost as long as St. Peter's at Rome, but not so large. About the choir, the sacred story is finely sculptured in snow-white marble, nor know I where it is exceeded. About the body of the church are the miracles of St. Charles Borromeo, and in the vault beneath is his body before the high altar, grated and enclosed in one of the largest crystals in Europe. To this also belongs a rich treasure. The cupola is all of marble within and without, and even covered with great planks of marble in the Gothic design. The windows are most beautifully painted. Here are two very fair and excellent organs. The fabric is erected in the midst of a fair piazza and in the centre of the city. Hence we went to the palace of the Archbishop, which is a quadrangle, the architecture of Teobaldi, who designed much for Philip II in the Escurial and has built much in Milan. Hence into the Governor's palace, who was constable of Castile. Tempted by the glorious tapestries and pictures, I had ventured so far alone that peeping into a chamber where the great man was under the barber's hands, he sent one of his negroes, a slave, to know what I was. I made the best excuse I could, and that I was only admiring the pictures, which he, returning and telling his lord, I heard the governor reply that I was a spy, on which I retired with all the speed I could, passed the guard of Swiss, got into the street, and in a moment to my company, who had gone to the Jesuits' church, which in truth is a noble structure, the front especially, after the modern. After dinner we were conducted to San Celso, a church of rare architecture, built by Bramante. The carvings of the marble facciata are by Annibal Fontana, whom they esteem at Milan equal to the best of the ancients. In a room joining to the church is a marble Madonna like a coloss of the same sculptor's work which they will not expose to the air. There are two sacristias, in one of which is a fine virgin of Leonardo da Vinci, in the other is one of Raphael de Urbino, a piece which all the world admires. The sacristan showed us a world of rich plate, jewels and embroidered copes, which are kept in presses. Next we went to see the great hospital, a quadrangular cloister of a vast compass, a truly royal fabric, with an annual endowment of 50,000 crowns of gold. There is in the middle of it a cross building for the sick, and just under it an altar so placed as to be seen in all places of the infirmary. There are diverse colleges built in this quarter, richly provided for by the same Borromeo and his nephew, the last Cardinal Frederico, some not yet finished but of excellent design. In San Eustorgio, they tell us, formerly lay the bodies of the three Magi, since translated to Cologne in Germany. They, however, preserve the tomb, which is a square stone on which is engraven a star, and under it sepulchrum trio magorum. Passing by St. Lawrence, we saw sixteen columns of marble, and the ruins of a temple of Hercules, with this inscription yet standing, Imp Caesari el Aurelio vero aug arminiaco medio particum maxi trib pot seven impi four cos three pp divi Antoni pidge divi Hadriani nepoti divi Trajani parthici pro nepoti divi neve abnepoti dec dec. We concluded this day's wandering at the monastery of Madonna della Grazia, and in the refectory admired that celebrated Cana Domini of Leonardo da Vinci, which takes up the entire wall at the end, and is the same that the great virtuoso Francis I of France 
was so enamoured of that he consulted to remove the whole wall by binding it about with ribs of iron and timber to convey it into France. It is indeed one of the rarest paintings that was ever executed by Leonardo, who was long in the service of that prince, and so dear to him that the king, coming to visit him in his old age and sickness, he expired in his arms. But this incomparable piece is now exceedingly impaired. Early next morning came the learned Dr. Ferrarius to visit us and took us in his coach to see the Ambrosian Library, where Cardinal Federico Borromeo has expended so vast a sum on this building and in furnishing with curiosities, especially paintings and drawings of inestimable value among painters. It is a school fit to make the ablest artists. There are many rare things of Hans Bruegel, and among them the four elements. In this room stands the glorious inscription of Caliero Cagliazzo Arconati, valuing his gifts to the library of several drawings by da Vinci. But these we could not see, the keeper of them being out of town, and he always carrying the keys with him. But my Lord Marshal, who had seen them, told me all but one book, a small, and that a huge folio containing four hundred leaves, full of scratches of Indians, etc., but whereas the inscription pretends that our King Charles had offered one thousand pounds for them, the truth is, and my lord himself told me, that it was he who treated with Galeazzo for himself, in the name and by permission of the king, and that the Duke of Feria, who was then governor, should make the bargain, but my lord, having seen them since, did not think them of so much worth. In the great room, where is a goodly library, on the right hand of the door, is a small wainscot closet furnished with rare manuscripts. Two original letters of the Grand Seigneur were shown us, sent to two popes, one of which was, as I remember, to Alexander the Sixth Borgia, and the other mentioning the head of the lance, which pierced our blessed Saviour's side, as a present to the Pope. I would fain have gotten a copy of them, but could not. I hear, however, that they are since translated into Italian, and that therein is a most honourable mention of Christ. We revisited St Ambrose's Church. The high altar is supported by four porphyry columns, and under it lie the remains of that holy man. Near it they showed us a pit or well, an obscure place it is, where they say St Ambrose baptised St Augustine and recited the Te Deum for so imports the inscription. The place is all so famous for some councils that have been held here, and for the coronation of diverse Italian kings and emperors, receiving the iron crown from the archbishop of this see. They show the history by Josephus written on the bark of trees. The high altar is wonderfully rich. Milan is one of the most princely cities in Europe. It has no suburbs, but is circled with a stately wall for ten miles, in the centre of a country that seems to flow with milk and honey. The air is excellent, the fields fruitful to admiration, the market abounding with all sorts of provisions. In the city are near one hundred churches, seventy-one monasteries, and forty thousand inhabitants. It is of a circular figure, fortified with bastions, full of sumptuous palaces and rare artists, especially for works in crystal, which is here cheap, being found among the Alps. They have curious straw work among the nuns, even to admiration. It has a good river and a citadel at some small distance from the city, commanding it, of great strength for its works and munitions of all kinds. It was built by Galeatius the Second, and consists of four bastions, and works at the angles and fronts. The graph is faced with brick to a very great depth, has two strong towers as one enters, and within is another fort, and spacious lodgings for the soldiers, and for exercising them. No accommodation for strength is wanting, and all exactly uniform. They have here also all sorts of work and tradesmen, a great magazine of arms and provisions. The foss is of spring water, with a mill for grinding corn, and the ramparts vaulted underneath. 
Don Juan Vasquez Coronado was now governor, the garrison Spaniards only. There is nothing better worth seeing than the collection of Signor Septalla, a canon of St Ambrose, famous over Christendom for his learning and virtues. Among other things, he showed us an Indian wood that has the perfect scent of civet, a flint or pebble that has a quantity of water in it which is plainly to be seen, it being clear as agate, diverse crystals that have water moving in them, some of them having plants, leaves and hogs bristles in them, much amber full of insects, and diverse things of woven amiantus. Milan is a sweet place, and though the streets are narrow, they are bound in rich coaches and are full of noblesse who frequent the course every night. Walking a turn in the portico before the dome, a cavaliero who passed by, hearing some of us speaking English, looked a good while earnestly on us, and by and by sending his servant, desiring we would honour him the next day at dinner. We looked on this as an odd invitation, he not speaking to us himself, but we returned his civility with thanks, though not fully resolved what to do, or indeed what might be the meaning of it in this jealous place. But on inquiry it was told he was a Scots colonel who had honourable command in the city, so that we agreed to go. This afternoon we were wholly taken up in seeing an opera represented by some Neapolitans, performed all in excellent music, with rare scenes, in which there acted a celebrated beauty. Next morning we went to the colonel's, who had sent his servant again to conduct us to his house, which we found to be a noble palace, richly furnished. There were other guests, all soldiers, one of them a Scotchman, but we could not learn one of their names. At dinner he excused his rudeness that he had not himself spoken to us, telling us it was his custom, when he heard of any English travellers, who but rarely would be known to pass through that city for fear of the Inquisition, to invite them to his house, where they might be free. We had a sumptuous dinner, and the wine was so tempting that after some house had gone about, and we had risen from the table, the colonel led us into his hall, where there hung up diverse colours, saddles, bridles, pistols, and other arms, being trophies which he had taken with his own hands from the enemy. Among them he would needs bestow a pair of pistols on Captain Ray, one of our fellow travellers, and a good drinking gentleman, and on me a Turkish bridle woven with silk and very curiously embossed, with other silk trappings, to which hung a half-moon, finely wrought, which he had taken from a bashaw whom he had slain. With this glorious spoil I rode the rest of my journey as far as Paris, and brought it afterward into England. He then showed us a stable of brave horses with his menage and cavalerizzo. Some of the horses he caused to be brought out, which he mounted, and performed all the motions of an excellent horseman. When this was done and he had alighted, contrary to the advice of his groom and page, who knew the nature of the beast and that their master was a little spirited with wine, he would have a fiery horse that had not yet been managed and was very ungovernable, but was otherwise a very beautiful creature. This, he mounting the horse, getting the reins in a full carriere, rose so desperately that he fell quite back crushing the colonel so forcibly against the wall of the menage, that though he sat on him like a centaur, yet recovering the jade on all fours again, he desired to be taken down, and so led in, where he cast himself on a pallet, and with infinite lamentations, after some time, we took leave of him, being now speechless. The next morning, going to visit him, we found before the door the canopy which they usually carry over the host, and some with lighted tapers, which made us suspect he was in a very sad condition. And so indeed we found him, an Irish friar standing by his bedside as confessing him, or at least disguising a confession, and other ceremonies used in extremis. For we afterward learned that the gentleman was a Protestant, and had this friar his confidant, which was a dangerous thing at Milan, had it been but suspected. At our entrance he sighed grievously and held up his hands, but was not able to speak. 
After vomiting some blood, he kindly took us all by the hand and made signs that he should see us no more, which made us take our leave of him with extreme reluctancy and affliction for the accident. This sad disaster made us consult about our departure as soon as we could, not knowing how we might be inquired after or engaged, the Inquisition being so cruelly formidable and inevitable on the least suspicion. The next morning, therefore, discharging our lodgings, we agreed for a coach to carry us to the foot of the Alps, not a little concerned for the death of the Colonel, which we now heard of, and who had so courteously entertained us. The first day we got as far as Castellanza, by which runs a considerable river into Lago Maggiore. Here at dinner were two or three Jesuits, who were very pragmatical and inquisitive, whom we declined conversation with as decently as we could, so we pursued our journey through a most fruitful plain, but the weather was wet and uncomfortable. At night we lay at Sesto. The next morning, leaving our coach, we embarked in a boat to carry us over the lake, being one of the largest in Europe, and whence we could see the towering Alps, and among them the great San Bernardo, esteemed the highest mountain in Europe, appearing to be some miles above the clouds. Through this vast water passes the river Titsinus, which discharges itself into the Po, by which mean Helvetia transports her merchandises into Italy, which we now begin to leave behind us. Having now sailed about two leagues, we were hauled ashore at Arona, a strong town belonging to the Duchy of Milan, where, being examined by the governor and paying a small duty, we were dismissed. Opposite to this fort is Andiera, another small town, the passage very pleasant with the prospect of the Alps covered with pine and fir trees, and above them snow. We pass the pretty island Isabella, about the middle of the lake, on which is a fair house built on a mount. Indeed, the whole island is a mount ascended by several terraces and walks, all set above with orange and citron trees. End of section 22